to have with us uh, today Professor uh, Brigitte Meyer from the uh, Department of Religious Studies at Utrecht University. Professor Meyer is a cultural anthropologist who uh, works mainly on Africa. She studies religion uh, from a material and post-colonial angle. Her, re her research is driven by an urge to make sense of the shifting places and roles of religion in our times and to show that the scholarly work in the field of religion is, an, is a, of important concern to the understanding and the shape of our world in the er, early 21st century. Uh, she was awarded the Academy Professor Prize and the Spinoza Prize in, in 2015 and began a comprehensive research program, Religious, uh, religious Matters. And I will send you, uh, I'll, in the chat, I'm going to send you the link to this project. <laughs> Um, in the chat box, I will send you a, a link to the to the project uh, because the inter internet site I think will be interesting interesting here to a lot of people. Um, she has published uh, so extensively on the uh, on the topic of religion of uh, religious materiality and is one of the editors of uh, the Journal of Material Religion. <laughs> um, what we usually do is before we start, we just make a short short introduction of the participants. Uh, so I'm Yael, and I'm a postdoc here at the Center of uh, Studies of Conversion. Uh, my topics are Christianity in Americas, and I'll just go on by my screen, uh, Roni. Great, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Roni Tsoref. I'm a, I'm a doctorate student in the center and I'm dealing with uh, Zionist art and Israeli art. Nice. Tamar. Uh, my name is uh, Tamar Otman. I'm a postdoc at the center as well and I work in okay. early medieval uh, geography and uh, identity construction. Tom. I'm Tom Fogel. I'm also a postdoctorate uh, fellow uh, at the center. And I study uh, occult knowledge transitions between uh, Muslims and Jews. Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah Shacham Razvi. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at the center. I study um, Jews in their Christian environments in high Middle Ages German speaking areas. Jackie. I'm Jackie Feldman. I'm a professor of anthropology at uh, Ben Gurion University. Um, I work on contemporary Christian pilgrimage, on uh, Holocaust memory, and most recently on um, um, selfies and Holocaust memory in a digital age. Daniela. Daniela Talmon Heller. I'm um, a member of the Department of Middle East Studies at Ben Gurion University. Um, my research fields are the history of the medieval Middle East, especially religion. Marganit. Yeah, you can call me Niti. It's shorter and easier to remember. Um, my name is Marganit or Niti Kasapu. I am a doctorant in the art department in Ben Gurion University. And uh, I study conversion, hybridity, and uh, syncretism in uh, artifacts from uh, uh, Western Europe uh, in the early, early medieval time. Effie? Hi, I'm Effie Shoham. I'm the director of the center. Um, I'm a social historian specializing in Jewish history, Jewish medieval history uh, in Europe. I study marginal individuals of sorts, and the current my current study is the Jewish medieval Jewish community of Cologne. Thank you, David. Hi, David Sabato. I'm postdoctoral uh, fellow. <laughs> and work on the uh, rabbinic development of rabbinic law in, in antiquity. Michal. 
Hi, my name is Michal Barashir Sigal. I'm a professor of rabbinic studies, Talmud, uh, in the Department of Jewish Thought and a member of the, um, how's it called? The committee. Committee, the steering committee. Steering committee of the center. Um, I deal with Jewish Christians in the first century CE and especially Jewish Christian interaction in the Babylonian Talmud. Thank you. Um, no, no. I hope I, do you hear me? Yes. yes. I have, okay, my name is Nono, I'm Nonrav Kokotkin, and I teach early modern and modern Jewish history at the, at the Goyen University. Kana? Hi, uh, Kana, a woman professor at the Department of Jewish History. Ancient Jewish history is my field. Nomi? So, uh, uh, Mati Golani? Oh, oh my God. Mati? Matt? Nomi is there. Uh, uh, Nomi, okay, you're there? Yeah. <laughs> we can't hear. Um. Um, I'm a, a pensioner uh, from Ben Gurion. I taught from 1974 till I retired, and um, I take an interest in Bible, women in the Bible, and midrash, and interesting listener. Thank you. What? Hello, I am an art therapist and psychotherapist. And uh, I am interested in the uh, fetish and the cultures and the, uh, all these things that uh, come out in the images of my uh, patients ah. in therapy. So it's another uh, view of point uh, to see the things. And I hope I will have uh, some uh, new ideas from uh, Professor uh, Birgit Meir. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Y Yossi? Okay. I, I, is there anyone else who, who I missed by mistake with my own? Not. I think I called it Matt. Yep. Okay, so I think we will just begin and. Uh... Yep. Okay, thank, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation and also for this introduction round. And I see that uh, you have expertise on things I find very interesting, but know little about. But perhaps uh, we can find a common ground in thinking about uh, religion and materiality, which is in a way also a matter theme, I guess, that might be looked at uh, from different uh, viewpoints. And I very much look forward to uh, also the uh, discussion. I want to uh, thank Yael in particular for, uh, in a way, setting up this uh, meeting. And um, we have agreed that I will give a lecture, although I realize that at this time of the day, it's also a bit tough. But yeah, I said it's about 40 minutes or so. I will do my best to present it in a lively manner. And I also have prepared uh, a PowerPoint. I must say that I'm impressed by your stamina. It's nine o'clock, later than nine o'clock uh, for you. It's now uh, 10 past eight uh, uh, over here. And so it's quite amazing, I think. It may be easier that we all can follow in, in fact from home. So I speak mm -hmm. to you from Amsterdam, from the attic of our house, which is my, uh, my study. And this is the, the day of the national commemoration of all the victims during uh, World War II concerning the murdered Jews, but also uh, other groups of people, Sinti, Roma, as well as uh, uh, also uh, soldiers in Dutch service. It's a long, long list leading up to Afghanistan. And there always is a two minute silence, which I, cannot break and would not wish to um, break. That is why, and I realized it late. That's why I asked uh, uh, Yael to start uh, 
uh, slightly later, but obviously this is a very important uh, event. I'm German and Dutch both, and that makes it doubly important for me also to honor this, um, this moment. So just uh, the king and queen have put uh, a wreath and there was silence and now there are other persons putting up wreaths, but that is the same every year. I need not uh, uh, witness that, but the previous thing is very important uh, for me also as a, um, a citizen. Okay, and where we had uh, all of a sudden a lot of sun, now it is uh, darker a bit, so I, I'm very happy to be able to do as much as possible in daylight. I should also say that what I present is uh, very much uh, a work in progress. It is part uh, of a larger article also I'm working on in which I reflect um, on the material turn. And I think we could try to, um, ah, no, it's too light. Huh? We could um, share the screen. I will see whether that is possible. Yes, that is possible. And you see that I slightly changed um, my title. I call it now Religion and Materiality, the question of the fetish and other matters. Over the past 20 years, the empirical, methodological and conceptual possibilities that open up by taking a material approach to religion have become apparent. Turning to the material culture of various religious traditions has opened our eyes to modes of lived religion beyond and underneath text-centered focuses on doctrines and beliefs. Appraising the material and corporeal dimensions of religion went along with a rising awareness that religions also entail multiple media other than texts alone that are distinctive from and authorized within particular religious traditions and inform religious ideas and practices. My own interest in the material turn was triggered by facing conceptual limitations with regard to grasping the stakes over clashes of the nature, role and value of things between Africans and Europeans in my research on the colonization and evangelization of West Africa. And here I faced what I call the question of the fetish. Fetish is a term that developed in the context of the encounters of Europeans and Africans in West Africa since the late 15th century, also during the slave trade. The things referred to as fetishes or idols, as missionary would also call them, had of course other original names. Fetish is, we could say with W.T. Mitchell, a category of bad objecthood employed to dismiss and classifies as inferior African modes of dealing with the spirit world through matter. This use of the term betrays an ideological standpoint and a semiotic ideology in the sense of Webb Keen that affirms a basically Protestant stance with regard to religion that rejects the worship of human made gods in the name of what is counted in the Calvinist tradition as the second commandment. This iconoclastic attitude with regard to things called fetishes raises a big question about the relation between religion and materiality. The fetish was a stepping stone for scholars, especially anthropologists, to question the terms through which we usually analyze religion. Clearly a focus on religious things offers an exciting entry point into alternative understandings of religion that challenge the proverbial post-Enlightenment Protestant bias, the unpacking of which can help to remap our scholarly mindsets and decenter knowledge production about religion. Now, why is it at all necessary and rewarding to thematize religion and materiality? Certainly the end between these terms does not signal an addition of the latter to the former, but rather spotlights a conceptual problem. The problem is that religion and materiality have long been conceptualized as being antagonistic. 
This conceptualization is grounded in the fifth 19th century debates triggered by the rise of scientific and dialectical materialism, which launched a critique of idealism. Religion was criticized as being a domain of misguided illusions about an unseen spiritual sphere that would have to be replaced by rational insights into the real material nature of things. And yet it is obvious that religion cannot exist outside of or beyond material forms and bodies, as many scholars, including Webb Keen and Matthew Engelke, have asserted. Attending to the relation between religion and materiality is a productive provocation with the aim to drive home the obvious point that material religion is not an oxymoron. The point is to engage in a thorough rethinking of how we understand religion by taking seriously its material and corporeal dimensions that have long been pushed to the margins of scholarly attention and reflection. In other words, while it is productive to think about religion and materiality at this point in time, ultimately the aim is to fold materiality back into our understanding of religion, making it unnecessary to mark materi materiality any longer. And this is the background against which I want to address the religion materiality nexus in this lecture, which has uh, these parts. So you can see here a bit the trajectory I have um, uh, prepared uh, uh, for us. Though in principle, the term material has a number of opposites in the framework of the material turn in the study of religion, its privileged counterparts are mental and spiritual. One of the main assets of the material turn was to approach religion as a mundane and practical endeavor emphasizing that it is humans who do religion with their bodies and senses, and by using all sorts of things to evoke a sense of the presence and reality of the divine. Thinking along this materialist line, of course, does not imply that religion is to be reduced to sheer matter so that the imaginary that is left after such stripping could be unmasked as a mere illusion. Religion exists as a sound social cultural phenomenon. It matters in the world because it gathers people into what I called an aesthetic formation organized around a shared imaginary, which points beyond the here and now, and yet is present through all sorts of material forms which are perceived, sensed, acted with, and thought about. The attribute material is well suited to develop new possibilities for research. But if material is merely employed as a permanent opposite to mental, the dualism in which both terms are trapped is reproduced, only switching material to the now privileged side. More forthcoming is the use of material to signal a move towards sublation, Aufhebung, one would say in German, that requires transcending and yet recuperating the, uh, the mental and related opposites in a dialectical manner, and this is the line I pursue. Taking as a starting point the concrete study of material forms, it aims to transcend the mental material dualism through which such, such forms are conventionally framed by a critical reflection about religion and materiality, aiming to recapture materiality as part of religion. Such a dialectical process of moving via a focus on concrete material forms to understanding materiality as intrinsic to a broadened concept of religion raises complex conceptual issues, which often remain rather implicit. And in the following, I will explicate some of them. What makes the material turn timely and intriguing is that it challenges a dualistic old fashioned idea about matter and the concomitant hubris about modern humans' capacity to arrange the world according to their will. As David Morgan explains succinctly in his, his new book that just appeared, The Thing About Religion, we cannot understand the relevance of materiality to the study of religion unless we learn to look beyond the idea that matter is a dead, passive, neutral substance manipulated by the sovereign subject of the human mind. Materiality is not like pliable clay or cookie dough in which we impress our will. 
It is how the world pushes back against us, needs or shatters our ideas, joins with us to make something bigger or longer lasting than our bodies. Agency does not belong only to human beings, but is shared by all kinds of things. Tools are things people make to extend the efforts of their bodies. But everything that composes our worlds exerts influence on us by interacting with our bodies, whether it was fashion to do so or not. Morgan's plastic phrasing asserts the need to develop a more synthetic and materially grounded understanding of humans in the world. This concern has become ever more pressing through climate change and the realization that human interventions have triggered the onset of the Anthropocene, as well as through the unsettling exposure to the corona pandemic, which reminds us of the basic entanglement of humans with each other and other species, which offers, we could say, a viral highway for the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus across the globe. Obviously, the material turn in the study of religion converges to some extent with the thriving and exciting field of new materialism. One central concern of new materialists is their rejection of anthropocentrism, understood as attributing to humans a special mastery over matter and sovereignty over the world in favor of understanding humans as being inextricably entangled in broader material assemblages. These assemblages contain and link all sorts of elements that are usually kept apart by employing dualisms of humans and objects, organic and non-organic matter, nature and society, or even matter and spirit that underpin the conventional materialism of the 19th century. So far, there have been few explicit and extensive exchanges between new materialists and scholars working on material religion. But see a recent in conversation in material religion, in fact, curated uh, by myself with Marianne um, uh, Burchard, Sonja uh, Hazard, Poyan uh, Tamimi Arab, and also a number of posts uh, on the website, the Re Religious Studies Project. As Frost and Cole point out in their much quoted introductory text to their volume, the key concern of scholars in this field is a new understanding of matter as agentive and vibrant. This understanding is grounded in the critique that in the history of philosophy, materialism and matter tended to be marginalized in favor of various permutations of idealism that privilege language, the subject and the mind. Such idealist remnants, Kost and Froll argue, still inform the critical intellectual project of constructivism with its strong emphasis on the power of language and discourse and what they call its allergy to the real. By contrast, stating that matter is all there is, new materialists strive for an ontological reorientation that is resonant with and to some extent informed by developments in the natural sciences an orientation that is post-humanist in the sense that in, it conceived of meta itself as lively or as exhibiting agency. The point for them is to articulate a new realist ontology that resonates with insights from contemporary natural sciences, especially the new understanding of meta in theoretical physics and draws out its consequences for the social and cultural sciences and ethics. In this sense, the project of this new materialism engenders a renegotiation of parameters for knowledge construction and the relations between the disciplines in the early 21st century. Notwithstanding my affinity with the concept of assemblage, with its uh, felicitous insistence on the relationality and mutual effects, we could also say agency of its constituents, I have certain reservations with regard to new materialism, which I at the same time find very inspiring. These concern first and foremost, the striving for a new realist um, ontology. And this is also an, uh, a point, a critique Peter Bräunlein launched in his really very worthwhile um, overview uh, discussion, thinking religion through things. In fact, like Bräunlein, I do not see it as a task for scholarship in the study of religion to work towards a new ontology. 
needed, in my view, is a substantial epistemological critique of the study of religion for sidelining and even devaluing the material and corporeal dimensions of religion. In this endeavor, notions such as assemblage and network are very useful to correct a misguided idea about the human capacity to survey and control the world. This focus on human survey and control relies on the framework of the homo faber, which overlooks the complex entanglements of humans in and with the world and their mutual influences and effects. Religion may well be understood as a set of practices and ideas that organize ways of being in the world through which humans are enveloped into assemblages. Next to human and non-human actors, these assemblages also include gods and other spiritual entities on the level, of course, of the human Im imagination and experience. What makes religion distinctive and intriguing that it calls forth a sense of the existence of gods and spiritual entities, we could also say transcendence, in the immanent with immanent means. And as uh, Sonia Hazard, who also wrote a really intriguing um, piece about the material turn in the study of religion, puts it, material things themselves are constitutive and uh, generative of religious uh, reality. I find this a very important statement, although I have some questions about the themselves, as you can imagine. To grasp the making of material portals that open up in an authorized manner to a professed beyond, I coined the concept sensational form. This uh, uh, image, and I think I can best explain it by some example. This image from the Wunderblut shrine in Bad Wilsnack, uh, Germany, which was rendered defunct in the course of the Reformation, but retained as an image by the Lutherans who took over the church may serve as an uh, example. So this was a shrine which contained uh, oblates that had started bleeding and that uh, were assumed to have a particular healing power. And many, many people flocked to this shrine, much to the dismay of, of Luther, who found this all uh, fancy um, irrationality, disbelief, um, uh, and so on, which he uh, criticized. So this whole uh, uh, activities at the Wunderblut uh, shrine could very well be analyzed as a sensational uh, form. But I think that also uh, images of defunct religion that have uh, in a way been put off uh, out of use as this Pieta image found in a second hand store can also remind in a way by being meta out of place of in a way uh, a sensational form that was woven around this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, image. Pointing at the more or less intensely experienced bonds between people and such a professed beyond to which these images and forms lead uh, that arise by gathering different kinds of agents and practices in one form, the concept of sensational form covers for a great deal the same ground, I think, as the concept of assemblage. The salient difference is that I find it important to acknowledge that as scholars, we can only analyze assemblages and networks from a human perspective and not as such. Acknowledging the embeddedness of humans in wider assemblages does not imply that one should pursue, in my view at least, an extreme non-anthropocentrism. Being part of matter, humans still think, speak, and feel about matter, and thus about themselves in the world by mobilizing many of the dualisms from which the new materialist ontology seeks to free itself. Moreover, an overdrawn anti-anthropocentrism, which places humans in assemblages with all sorts of non-human actors, including spiritual entities, may easily slide into a theological or religionist stance. I would reject such a stance as we can only study as scholars how humans imagine, act upon, and communicate with such entities. And so as scholars, we should not take these entities at face value. Also, the focus on assemblage as a fluid or rhizomatic gathering of different kinds of elements or actors may ensue neglecting the roles played by humans in maintaining actual power relations and hierarchies in terms of class, gender, race, ethnicity, and education, in short, the political. 
My basic point here is that I do not think that appraising materiality would allow us as scholars at long last to get hold of the real ground of existence. The world of matter of which humans are part by virtue of their embodied being can only be grasped through culturally constituted forms such as science, categories, concepts. These forms are at the base of the social construction of reality in which religion partakes and which scholars in the social sciences and humanities try to understand. This construction is of course material, yet not reducible to matter as such, because our human approach to matter is always mediated via material forms. Therefore, I would employ materiality as a concept and a tool that is good uh, to challenge a mentalistic concept of religion and idealism in general. As a concept, it needs to be stressed, materiality is not congruous with what it is referred to as, um, as matter in, uh, as, as a physical uh, uh, process, as something out there of which we are part and in which we are, but that can never be grasped and uh, uh, pictured and analyzed in its entirety. Materiality, uh, materiality is about matter and seeks to approximate it conceptually, but ultimately matter cannot be fully captured by human modes of signification, even though science themselves are material, a point made very interestingly in a new book by Volkert Krech, unfortunately uh, in German, so not so widely available yet. Acknowledging the materiality of religious signs and forms, and thus the ways in which religion is manifest in the world through material forms, is the key concern of the material turn in the study of religion. The research inspired by the material turn, as is showcased, for instance, in the journal Material Religion, shows, I think, the merits of this approach. And yet, I think that there remains a break or gap between the world as such and the phenomenological worlds of lived experience. Our scholarly analysis has to take into account the ways in which signification and communication constitute worlds of lived experience that are material, but can always only be known partially. The sense of a gap or break and the sense of being at a loss with regard to a professed unknown, what Matthijs van der Port calls the rest of what is, is a prime scenario mobilized by religions in past and present. And as scholars, we can study such scenarios, but still cannot help but mind the gap. It would be a scholarly illusion to think that religionis religionism or new materialism would transport us to that other side of real matter. As a concept, materiality signals the importance to situate humans in their relations to a broad set of material forms with which they engage through their bodies and senses when doing religion and through the use of which they are shaped. So far, our understanding of materiality in the study of religion has been mainly developed through the study of material culture and especially things, a term which is often preferred to object, which is limited to utilitarian uses and definitions as explained by Bill Brown. The prominent focus on human things relations has yielded important insights into a broad array of possible forms of agency that move beyond a conventional idea of humans as dominating the object world. Following Latour, networks of different actors can be identified while Hodder calls attention to the past dependency of human things entanglements and entrapments across time. The category of things and the possibility for agency entailed by them is further differentiated into objects, building and images as prominent subcategories. In the framework of the material turn, each of these subcategories has generated fresh research, interdisciplinary conversations, and conversely, help to develop and refine the concept of materiality. Oops, a bit more light. <laughs> In my own research, which has been much inspired by David Morgan, I have extensively worked on religious images and visual regimes. This was of special interest 
so as to correct the text focus that long dominated the study of religion empirically and above all conceptually. Echoing a Calvinist Protestant appraisal of an iconism as a normative default, the study of religion offered little room for a thorough analysis of images and visual culture. Conversations with scholars in art history and especially German Bildwissenschaft made me think about images as media employed to imagine and picture an invisible real. The image itself, as pointed by art historian Hans Belting, is a material form with an intrinsic property of generating presence in and through a pictorial medium. Such a take on images as material media to achieve iconic presence is very productive for a deeper understanding of what Terje Stordalen and I called the figuration and sensation of the unseen in Judaism, Christianity and Islam and beyond. The extensive work on religious images and visual culture has been important in reconceptualizing religion from a material and corporeal angle. Similarly, a focus on buildings and objects has allowed for new empirical foci for research and instigated a deeper understanding of how religion matters for believers and outsiders by virtue of being present in the world through concrete material forms. In the uh, Religious Matters in an Entangled World Research Project, which was uh, uh, already um, uh, mentioned, uh, we have dealt uh, extensively, in fact, with these um, uh, categories. So I here made a screenshot uh, uh, for you of some works that we would group as um, yeah, Religious Matters in terms um, of uh, uh, images. We have also done uh, certain things on um, uh, objects, and we have also focused a lot on um, uh, buildings. Uh, of course, as a concept intended to approximate matter, materiality ultimately is about everything. And this somewhat dazzling realization may be the reason why materiality is often referred to in an abstract sense. At the same time, we can only get uh, the material and corporeal dimensions of religion into the picture via a pragmatic stance that focuses on certain, albeit provisional categories of material forms for the sake of empirical insights and grounded conceptual reflection. But I would like to propose that scholarly work inspired by the material turn should take into account the broader array of categories and their translations through which different facets of materiality can be unpacked in relation to religion. Materiality is an umbrella concept that must be further unpacked for the sake of empirically and conceptually innovative work. Materiality refers to a range of categories that differentiate the semantic domain uh, of things next to objects, images, buildings, but also uh, text, dress, food. Then we can think of substances, water, light, air, blood, milk, alcohol, and so on, animals, machines, plants, stones and minerals, viruses and bacteria, digital forms. In our research program, we have also set up the uh, dossier uh, Corona uh, that looks at COVID-19 as a material form after realizing that viruses in a way are meta par excellence that thrive through entanglement. The material forms grouped into these and other categories are also assigned value through meta categories, which may be positive so we, or neutral. You may talk about tools and art, devotional objects, heritage, and so on, or dismissive, openly dismissive, as is the case with categories such as fetish and idol. As taking materiality as a concept does not offer a shortcut to matter as such, it is important to be alert to the fact that people apprehend, use and assign value to material forms through what Keen calls semiotic ideologies. The categories and semiotic ideologies employed by scholars are not universal, but predominantly grounded in Western classification systems. Hence the need to be alert to the intricacies and fallacies of intercultural translation. This is particularly important for scholars working on former frontier zones of European colonial outreach. In this context, African figures were recast as idols and fetishes by Western traders, missionaries, and colonial administrators. 
and thus made to symbolize a scandalous materiality that became a marker of so-called primitive religion and was taken to legitimate messianization and colonial rule. It is the task of scholars, I would say, to engage in translation across different cultural settings so as to question and possibly broaden existing categories around thingness and other material forms, thereby surpassing a modernist idea of material culture as mere dead, non-animate objecthood. And here is located the question of the fetish, as, which, as we will soon see, also involves even the question of food. So far, I paid much attention in my work to missionary preaching among the ever, the negative stance towards fetishes and idols. Both terms have different genealogies, but are used as synonyms, and they are made to refer to legba wo, legba figures placed in public spaces and homes made from earth and employed as places where spirits dwell and can be summoned. In my book, Translating the Devil, I primarily focused on the 19th and early 20th century activities of missionaries of the uh, Bremen mission in their field among the Eva in colonized Togo and Gold Coast. And I pursued how the categories of fetish and idol continue to live on in African independent and Pentecostal churches up to our time, where still these terms are employed to refer in a dismissive manner to gods and spirits as instances of idol idolatry, which is to be fought. But what about the things themselves? And is the term thing at all adequate? Seeing how the category of fetish was mapped on the figures called Lekba by the Eva prompted me to rethink the religion materiality uh, relation as noted. But now I think that I did not go far enough. My approach was not sufficiently material. So recently I started a new collaborative research on a missionary collection of Lekba figures, so-called fetishes, and also Jokawo, so-called charms or Zaubermittel as they were called in German, from the ever in current day Togo and Ghana. Here in this presentation, I will focus on the Legba figures. The Übersee Museum Bremen, ah yeah, this is the, the, the preaching uh, uh, setting. The Übersee Museum Bremen hosts a collection of Legba figures that were assembled by missionaries of the Norddeutsche Missionsgesellschaft during their activities among the Ewe in the late 19th and early 20th century in particular by Karl Spies. And here, um, uh, well, you see a collection brought together of Joker by Zaubermittel, by Charms, by uh, Spies. And here you see some um, uh, pages from his diary where he describes uh, Legbawo, where he makes paintings, uh, uh, drawings uh, of them, uh, and also draws up a list of uh, things that were uh, shipped and these objects were then also analyzed in ethnographic publications. The objects are kept in the museum uh, depot and some are on display in the Schau magazine. This collection forms the core of our research project. I propose to approach these objects as religious matters that enshrine colonial and post-colonial entanglements of people, objects and ideas in Africa and Europe. And as part of collections assembled in colonial times and now kept in the museum, they are also pressing matter that calls for being scrutinized. The idea is to track and unpack these entanglements by following the stations of their trajectory as listed here. So from their origin and use among the Eva to uh, uh, in fact, uh, these uh, things being put at rest uh, in, the, um, in the depot. Due to Corona, the project could not be kicked off with the speed I hoped for, but fortunately I could speak to the ever priest Christopher Vonkujovi in January 2020 in Accra, together with my PhD student Angel Antonio Grossi. I showed the priest some photographs of these figures uh, as they are kept in the depot. He has, interestingly, similar Legba figures in his own shrine. And we discussed all the pictures I had with me of Legba in the collection. 
For him, the items were not mere objects that had moved through a long trajectory in which they moved from being religious items that harbor spirit power to mere museum objects. The Legba figures for him were likely to be alive and hungry, eagerly awaiting to be called by a priest and fed. So uh, he said, ah, and these things, honestly, they are hungry, oh, hungry, hungry, hungry. Yeah, they have not been fed for ages. No more than 100 years, I say. Even some are inside baskets. More than 100 years, I say again. Yes, but we need to do a simple reading to find out whether they are still active. But how do you find out? We can how? Even by looking at the picture, we can um, uh, connect. No, 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 no. They have to call some African, invite someone to come over there, pray to the spirits and feed them. They can keep them, but just to feed them to be active because spirit is spirit. It is not going to die, but it is going to be there. Then I said, but I think that in their thinking, they don't, they're the museum people, they don't see them as spirits. They see them as objects, you see. The point is that someone has to let them understand that these things were not just objects for Africans, they were spiritual objects and people believe until someone go physically to them and, um, and uh, then do a demonstration by like this Lekba, pray to the Lekba and call the Lekba to do something, give it one or two days. If the Lekba is able to accomplish that, then you know it's alive. For me, this was an amazing realization. In my imagination as researcher, I had been concerned about the category transitions of Legba figure, uh, the Legba figures un underwent during their trajectory. So I took them as objects that were put into changing assemblages. But I did not think about the limits of the object category other than criticizing their categorization as fetishes. Christopher von Kujovis remarked about the fact that the spirits that are in and part of the Legba are hungry opened up my mind to the importance of feeding as a dominant religious practice. The figures themselves have absorbed all the food that has been put there as part of the regular feeding and annual sacrifices. In a way, the food becomes inextricably connected with the Legba. While scholars may uh, keep on being fascinated by the fetish as a thing with a will, my encounter with Christopher von Kujovi alerted me to the fact that what the Legba wants is food. Of course, in the study of religion, there has always been an interest in food, yielding studies of taboos and dietary laws, sacred animals and plants, fasting, sacrifice, communal meals, and so on. But food and feeding, a central part of the practices to which people link up with the spirit world has not received much in attention in work on material religion, alas. Food is the material form par excellence through which people are part of the world and render it meaningful and religion plays a central role in all this. So I think that the fetish question can be further unpacked by bringing in food as a central aspect of material religious practice. And this of course, does not only pertain to every religion, but applies more broadly. And here I come to the end, to my conclusion. Food is certainly a fruitful direction to be taken for future research from a material angle. Food functions quite differently from material forms as texts, buildings, or images. Food is the most immediate manner through which people relate to the world symbolically and ingest it so as to live. Therefore, food is a highly suitable material to approximate matter and better grasped uh, and, and uh, to better grasp how humans in their practices of cooking, feeding, eating, digesting, and so on, are part of the world in a deeply substantial manner. These thoughts make me appreciate David Chilester's remark that religion is often more like cooking than like philosophy. Yes, indeed, but taking cooking seriously um, may in turn yield a philosophy that sets off from the stomach. As a prime advocate of 19th century, century materialism, Ludwig Feuerbach already insisted that the human being is what he or she eats. This gastro philosophy takes the stomach as its anchor point to move 
from an old philosophy, as he called it, that started with thought and left people without bread, to a new philosophy that begins with food and eating. So he wrote, how did not the concept of substance vex philosophy? What is it, me or non-me, mind or nature, or the unity of both? Yes, the unity, but what does it say? The food only is the substance. The food is the identity of mind and nature. Where there is no fat, there is no meat. But where there is no fat, there is no brain, no spirit. And the fat comes only from food. The food is the spinozistic henkai pan, the all embracing, the essence of the beings. Everything depends on eating and drinking. Presently, Feuerbach's work is rediscovered by several um, uh, scholars, including the German philosopher and historian Harald Lemke, who appraises Feuerbach for developing what he calls a gastrosophic anthropology of existence. I take these gastrophilosophical openings as appetizing food for thought in our future explorations of the religious materi materiality nexus, both in an empirical and a conceptual sense. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I will de-share my screen. Um, okay, so I think we will take questions. Yes. It's, it's rain here and it's a beautiful sunset uh, as well. Yeah. So you see me in the sun, but maybe you heard the rain uh, uh, pouring uh, whilst I was uh, speaking, speaking, yeah. It makes you realize also the importance of light uh, and water, right? <laughs> Which is another field. I think the material turn uh, uh, could move uh, uh, more, yeah. Uh, so uh, if, if, not, I'll, if not, I'll just begin because there was something that I was thinking about during your, your entire lecture and at the end uh, even more so. And uh, that's the importance of visual, the visual and material culture. Uh, usually when there's studies about material culture, they are about things that have to do uh, with sight. Sort of like there's a visual dominance uh, in material cu culture. And while you were talking, and I think that's kind of also the point with food that it sort of touches on different kinds of senses and different kinds of ways to experience the world. So yeah. smell, for example, and how that works within religious contexts. Um, um, I also thought it was very interesting, the idea that the material need, needs material to, to, to sort of come back to life. The object needs to be fed. It needs to be materialized, not pray to, to sort of come, come back and see if it's living or, or not. So I don't know, these are just sort of some general, not very uh, <laughs> well articulated thoughts, but yeah. the, the, importance of the, the importance of visuality is sort of like a hegemonic dominance of it. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. That is a very nice point, an important point. And of course, I, I have been very much interested in images also because I think that in the study of religion, in contrast to art history, images have somehow not gained enough attention or always from a quite limited uh, frame that can be traced back to something like the second commandment. So I found that the study of religion uh, would need in fact more expertise to think about and deal with images. At the same time, I do not think that we should uh, uh, keep it there. For me, this has been an important, uh, also conceptual endeavor, but of course images uh, are something people look at. So uh, seeing is, is a sense that um, always requires some distance. And if we are seriously about the material turn and want to better understand in a way how humans are part of the material world, we should definitely look at other sense impressions, the use of other senses than seeing alone. So the touch uh, is very important. Hearing is very important. There has been quite some work uh, uh, on that. And of course, there is this long history of doing work on eating. But somehow, also, if you search the journal Material Religion, you will find quite few things on food. 
the bulk of uh, things are about uh, images and uh, objects and buildings uh, uh, and so on. So all kinds of things people have made and use and so on, which is very, very interesting. And I think it's part of a kind of therapeutic uh, uh, endeavor to also get rid in a way, get beyond uh, uh, the suspicion of idolatry. And in that sense, it is interesting. But my idea when I said, we should unpack materiality is indeed to realize that there are other categories uh, which we can distinguish and expand, which include food. And then we get uh, uh, into, yeah, more intense, I would say, material um, relations, material entanglements and uh, uh, configurations that are never beyond meaning making. Food is of course a marker of uh, distinction, is subject to heavy, uh, um, uh, symbolization and so on, but but it would lead us into um, another world and also help um, to link up uh, with a lot of research in the study of religion on um, on sacrifice, on taboos, food taboos, uh, uh, dietary laws, uh, and so on, which were not necessarily uh, undertaken in the context of a search for a kind of rethinking of uh, religion and materiality. So I thought that this is a very, um, very nice uh, uh, point. Aha, and I also see a question here. When the legba are fed, are they fed an animal sacrifice? If so, then is this not a multi-sense? Yeah, indeed, it is. And that is something I find very, very um, uh, interesting and uh, uh, important. So legba are fed uh, with blood as a, a life force and there are different kinds of animals that are being used and they are also fed with uh, alcohol, which uh, indeed uh, stands for a kind of uh, um, a spirit. And I think that this is, uh, for me, just thinking through the legba as a kind of prototype fetish mm -hmm. from the angle of food is interesting because it also allows us other uh, ways of engaging with the leg bar, which I can't really even translate just as a thing, let alone as, um, as object. And that could uh, in a way point at a much, uh, at, at a different uh, human uh, something entanglement. Effie? Yeah, um, uh, thanks very much. This was, this was extremely thought provoking. And, and I think um, within the sequence of the year, I personally thought that uh, this lecture would have... Effie, Effie, no some aim at Oh, wait. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. So, um, first of all, it was extremely thought-provoking and, and, and very, very uh, interesting to me. And uh, I humbly think that this lecture should have been way earlier this year, uh, kind of putting or, or putting us within a, 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 a much more theoretical framework, but um, I'm glad it happened now. Um, my questions are uh, go in two angles. Angle number one is whether you see a distinction, especially with the legba and or maybe other um, deities or representation of deities or representation of spirits um, between two-dimensional and three-dimensional uh, objects or things, right? Um, because uh, um, one would think, especially with the issue of being fed, that uh, within the context of symbol, symbol in symbolism and what the object represents or what the thing represents, a three-dimensional object would represent something that is more uh, with a presence, while a two-dimensional object would not represent that much of a presence. Uh, and I was wondering whether there are at all um, two-dimensional objects that represent the spiritual world, and are they also fed? Um, and going back to the issue of symbolism and what the uh, object symbolize, um, is there anything beyond food that represents the communication between human beings and the legba? Um, or is food just a sort of initiation or a animation of the legba once uh, one wants to communicate with them, right? Mm. Uh, 
this is my question and it comes from absolute ignorance. I'm, I'm... No, no, I, I like these questions. Thank you very much. Also for your kind words in the beginning. I think, unfortunately, it could not even have been given earlier because I, I'm still working on this uh, lecture, somehow uh, finding myself to, on the one hand, insist on the importance of an empirical study of mater material things, but introducing materiality as a concept that will never, never, that will approximate matter, but never uh, lead us beyond, in a way, uh, symbolization and, in a way, the domain of the mental. That is also why I, I, I would reject a simple dualism. Now we do material and before we did something else. I think that is, uh, would be a stupidity and we just have to uh, uh, rethink. And I think that is something where we reach now with the material turn, we have to rethink how we see the mental, the symbolic uh, and what is called material um, related. And my aim is really in the end to fold materiality back into how we understand uh, religion uh, in an expanded uh, uh, manner. But so th thank you very much. I'm now just working um, uh, on this. Uh, I want to start with the um, a second uh, uh, part of your uh, question. So um, how humans uh, relate uh, to the leg. But I came to understand that feeding is incredibly important and that feeding in fact and prayer come uh, together. So you pray with uh, alcohol, for example. So the prayer is said whilst uh, um, dripping alcohol uh, uh, or blood uh, um, on the side. So it comes uh, together. So prayer is not simply uh, a linguistic uh, thing, something one says, but always something uh, one does. And uh, feeding is, is very, very um, important, but it carries, of course, other symbolic acts like praying and communication. And the aim I found very interesting when I heard uh, Christopher von Kujovi, who is a contemporary priest, and it resonated with earlier uh, priests and stuff I had read about them. It's a quite, uh, yeah, down to earth uh, attitude towards uh, the Lekwa because basically you maintain them, but you also put them to work and they have to show what they can do and you want them to be active and so on. So I found it very, very interesting how a priest talks about these uh, uh, spirits uh, that uh, in a way are part of the legba, but can also move out and do all kinds of uh, uh, things. Sometimes it sounded to me as if he would speak of animals or persons uh, uh, of sorts. So that I found very, very um, uh, interesting. And I also find uh, your first question very, interesting. I would be very interested to see how different material forms might allow for different forms of presence. I do think, and that, that is something I learned from Hans Belting, the art historian I quoted, mm -hmm. that also images, uh, and images can be two-dimensional, a painting, uh, in fact, uh, uh, contain the physical uh, um, picture, contains an image that mm -hmm. we as viewers, in a way, see in the physical painting. So the physical painting mm -hmm. uh, mediates uh, something that is made to appear and it is the viewer to whom it appears. Mm -hmm. And this is also a form of genesis of presence through a two-dimensional um, uh, uh, thing. But I would very much agree that it is important to uh, realize in a way what kind of presence would be uh, brought about by these three dimensional um, uh, features. And I think there the, the presence is very much the presence of the spiritual force that is associated with matter. So it is not this visual uh, thing, but it is a kind of, Von Kujovi called it as being enveloped in a way with the vibrations uh, uh, of matter. So he chose for quite new materialist, uh, a language, but it is really of being in a way part uh, uh, with very basic uh, fundamental forces in the universe. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it's a different kind of uh, uh, presence. I would say that in one way or the other, sensational forms that are authorized uh, uh, in a religious tradition, whether it uh, con has to do with a two-dimensional image or three-dimensional uh, one or something like Legba, which is very, very little figurative, 
it is about uh, a genesis of presence, but how this presence occurred and what is present is uh, very different. And uh, I'm in fact very happy about your question. It, uh, it will allow me to further um, develop this. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, yeah. I find it very nice to see that we have two children uh, <laughs> around, also perhaps wondering what this mosaic uh, all is about, right? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My son is very big, uh, 27, so long time. Um, there's another one in, in the chat. Um... Ah. Some 2D images, um, almost 3D, as in the multiple readings of Aboriginal art. Yeah, yeah, that's, I find also very interesting. How indeed, when uh, we look even at something uh, two-dimensional, we can take a photograph or an image, we may make it uh, into something um, uh, um, larger, three-dimensional. Three so that is indeed this process of seeing something in a picture, which it mediates, which may then in a way, move out of this frame and the two uh, two dimensions and uh, expand to something um, larger. Yeah, I, I like this uh, point and uh, ha have to think about that more. Thank you. Um. Can I be a pest and ask another question? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, what the legba are made of. You mentioned earth, but See, we can't hear you again. Oh, OK. Sorry. Um, again, I, I got um, the beginning. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm asking about what the components of what the Legba are made of. Um, yeah. You mentioned earth, uh, but yeah. it seemed that there are more material components yeah. and and that yeah. there there seems to be some sort of um, logic or what the, what what the uh, um, components are. I, I saw a skull of an animal uh, and I yeah. saw also um, stones. So what is the material meaning? Yeah, exactly. Uh, like this, this the... one, right? you see, I right. found also very interesting. Well, all Lekbas have cowries. Cowries have been used as currency, as money, uh, in fact. And uh, they, they uh, came, uh. they are not original to uh, Africa, they came from the Pacific, but they were used as strings to pay with. But with um, colonialism, European currencies were introduced, but this remained um, ritual money. Mm -hmm. But cowries also, uh, they function as eyes, mm -hmm. and they function also as, uh, well, you can imagine that as a vagina. So it's fertility and mm -hmm. seeing at the same time. and. Um, so cowries are part of uh, uh, Legba figures. They are put there as eyes and in uh, uh, other ways, as, as openings, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, for transfers uh, and, um, mm -hmm. and contacts. Uh, they also, and this, this uh, Legba, for example, has been made uh, as Christopher uh, Vonkujovi thought, at least, from a dog's head. So uh -huh. it was a Legba that was assigned to operate as a watchdog to take care, to protect um, the people in a particular um, setting. And what is very important is that, uh, and you can see that here quite well, because some of the Legba figures uh, got spoiled in the museum, but then you can look into the interior. A Legba is only powerful if it contains certain herbs. And the herbs also uh, uh, occasionally have to be refreshed. In fact, the, the power of, of the spirits is in the herbs uh, uh, of the leg bar. And herbs and spirits, in fact, match each other. You cannot even separate the two very um, uh, clearly, although in the context, in a way, of colonization and later independence, of course, a modern medical system came. And in this context, also uh, certain people were seen as traditional healers and herbalists who mm -hmm. would deal with herbs without all the rituals. But there is an idea that herbs can speak, herbs can act, uh, uh, and so on. And these are, in a way, at, at the core of the Legba. So that is where the deep 
power um, is. And I found that very interesting when we went through uh, the, the legwa. Here you also see it. This is, it's, it's really also sad. I don't know exactly yet why these legwa figures became so deplored and destroyed, you see. So here is an, an opening where the um, herbs were, but there's nothing around uh, anymore. And um, we do not know yet uh, what, what exactly the trajectories of these things were, these legbars were, and how they got partly um, uh, destroyed in this way. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to conduct uh, more research on them, because I think mm -hmm. that these are, in fact, openings into a whole cosmos. And I hope that we can be able also um, uh, together with a Ghanaian archaeologist, uh, Kocho Gavua, who also is part of this project, to undertake some forensic research to find out about the elements out of which uh, the lekba are made. For we can call it lekba, but it's also a polymcest or a comp composite of so many different parts. And what would have to happen is that one would in detail, in a way, uh, find out which parts um, uh, are in it. But I think that so far, often these kind of figures have been analyzed more yeah, as part of a particular category of things with their own will and so on, which is all very interesting. But these are containers of worlds. And I think it would be incredibly interesting to analyze that in more detail. At the same time, there is a lot of secrecy about that. So which uh, uh, herbs are for, used for what purposes and so on is not something one would very easily um, find out about, but I hope that with this uh, team, in a way, of uh, scholars uh, from from Ghana and Netherlands, uh, Germany, we, we will be able to perhaps make this collection of things that were also done away because people converted to Christianity, right? But to make it somehow speak, and I think that one could use these these legwa figures as an entry point into, yeah, another world, right? Uh, and I, that is what I um, very much want to uh, do, but yeah, I'm very annoyed uh, that COVID so far makes all this difficult. At the same time, it's interesting that Christopher Vonkujovi also organized um, kind of ceremonies on his, um, um, in his shrine, Magic Temple, also to protect people um, against uh, the virus. At the same time, he tells everyone, in contrast to some of the Pentecostals, he tells everyone to stick to the WHO rules because in his view, there's no contradiction at all between modern science mm -hmm. and what he's doing, which I also find very interesting. So it is also not religion in this, it's a belief system geared to another world. It is a very, yeah, for lack of a better word, it's a very material entangled kind of activity. And he also takes in so many elements from everywhere. He's also interested in Kabbalistic science and so on. My PhD student, Angel Antonio Grosso, Grossi writes uh, about him and this tremendous uh, urge to, to bring in uh, uh, yeah, elements from so many uh, yeah, it's especially secret, the, the secret parts of religious um, uh, traditions about which I do not know uh, so much. I'm just very much interested in a way in uh, perhaps unpacking uh, somehow, uh, yeah, understanding better what these things are. And so far I have so much tried to, yeah, also see the, 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 the gap between um, the dismissal of these things and their description as fetishes and then what they are as legba. So that difference interested me. But now I'm more and more interested in what intrinsically a legba is yeah, and what it does and so on. For I think this is the work through which we can, in a way, try to rethink uh, um, what we are doing as scholars. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I, I see you, you have a... Yeah, yeah, you are sharing, eh? So, okay. uh, Daniela. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, lecture. Professor Mayer, I read your um, inaugural, uh, this 
um, your inaugural talk in uh, 2011, uh, published as an author meets its critics, right? Yes, yes. In the um, Journal of Religion and Society, and uh, um, maybe you should say that the, it, it was, uh, if I read it correctly, an, an appeal to a really change of uh, um, attitudes or a mindset in, in this particular institution at the, at the uh, Department of Religious Studies in, in Utrecht. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I'd like to ask you um, how successful do you think this uh, uh, this appeal has been in you you, you mentioned um, your your hope actually to integrate the study of materiality into the broader study of religion uh, right not not to take uh, a not to on the one hand to open uh, new venues and on the other but finally to integrate into uh, previous uh, um, ways of uh, thinking and, and, and research. So I'd like to ask you, in, in this, at, at your particular uh, department, and more generally, if you could say, uh, how effective has, has been this uh, idea to introduce, reintroduce, um, the, the study of materiality into the study of religion, and then, and also, if you could say something about terms and concepts, is uh, would religion and material culture, if someone uses the the, the uh, term uh, religion and material culture, would you think this implies something different than materiality and religion? Or religion is it like a, a more old-fashioned way of uh, thinking? Um, if you could clarify a little bit, what, what are your, what are the terms you would use that, that best um, represent your attitude? Well, this is a very uh, big uh, question, but uh, thank you for reading um, uh, that piece. And indeed, it is based on my inaugural lecture. Uh, I had previously worked in the Department of Anthropology and then moved to Utrecht University and found myself in religious studies. And I felt I had to reinvent myself as an anthropologist against this broader horizon. And I enjoyed that because I thought it would also allow me to yeah, broaden my own um, horizon. I've always been very much interested uh, in the study of religion, but also I thought that I could try to bring in certain things into the study of religion. And one of the things that I think I could bring in there was also the importance of thinking about the study of religion as potentially um, a discipline that is comparative and that wants to work in a general uh, manner through comparison without, however, lapsing into a quite, with hindsight, Eurocentric vocabulary. So how to bring Africa in without uh, an evolutionary um, thinking? How can one think about religion in and from Africa? Uh, um, yeah, as something that happens in our contemporary time. And that is also um, mixed, of course, with uh, a tradition as uh, Christianity, which is often seen as European, I would see it very much as grounded in the Middle East, and that's also how it is seen in uh, Africa, by, uh, by, by the way. So I found that very, very important to, in a way, think about uh, religion and analyze religion from a more trans-regional perspective in an awareness of a very broad global entanglement, which we should not blend, uh, blend out. So that is one important thing. And the second is that I think that I was able to um, yeah, also set up a project that many of my colleagues and students also find interesting that looks indeed already empirically at uh, religion from this material uh, perspective. This is very interesting also in the Netherlands, where in fact now less than 50% count themselves as being members of religious organizations. And Christianity, which is always uh, very divided in the Netherlands, has also become a minority uh, religion now. Mm -hmm. And uh, But what we do see is a host of uh, buildings, uh, from church buildings and objects that are somehow discarded and dismantled 
and they are recast as heritage. And I think that a material approach is very useful to see unchurching and um, secularization, not as, okay, Christianity ceases and goes away, but it is a material process of reworking Christianity as heritage. And that is something we are very much interested in. And I think, uh, so this material approach proves to be very fertile uh, uh, there. And I like that because it corrects a very easy idea of secularization, which I find, I wouldn't deny that it's such a process, but I found it a bit limited and uh, too abstract. So this kind of material focus is helpful. Likewise, the Dutch society is a heavily pluralizing society with different religious uh, uh, groups uh, that are uh, active and in place. There are lots of conflicts uh, about the building of mosques. There are conflicts about the use of certain images uh, of Mohammed, Mohammed cartoons and all that. Again, a material entry point can help to understand clashes uh, about religion and with regard to religious uh, traditions. So in that sense, I think it is a timely um, take on religion that allows us to unpack these complexities that, that come with plural religious environments in a secular uh, framework as um, uh, the, the Netherlands. But I would say that uh, ultimately, um, I'm very much interested in empirical work, but I try to use the empirical work also to rethink religion, to uh, think about what are we doing? And so I have come to think that no, my concern is not just to establish material culture studies in the study of religion, which is, by the way, something that also we as editors of uh, material religion uh, uh, rejected. That is not enough. We want to, uh, in a way, rethink religion from the angle of materiality. And then, yeah, as I try to say, fold materiality back into religion so that it will no longer be necessary to say, by the way, religion is a material process. Of course, of course it is. Religion is indeed how people, in a way, uh, uh, work on certain materials to also enmesh themselves in the world and a beyond. Religion is working with materials in so many different ways, and it involves all these material practices. How could we think that religion is just about uh, belief, which is the kind of ultra Protestant idea that even in Protestant practice is not uh, maintained. So I want to come back to this idea of uh, religion is something people do with their bodies, with stuff uh, uh, and so on. Yeah, so I don't know whether that is an uh, uh, answer. <laughs> Thanks very much. It was uh, definitely an answer and, uh, and, and, an, and, and an inspiring one, I would say. Um, but I think uh, for, for us Jews, <laughs> there's, uh, a, I think there, there's less, religion is, is uh, not, never thought of, of, of something only in the spiritual sphere, I think. Yeah, yeah. What, what would others uh, yeah. say about that? I think you are very right. And that is, of course, uh, a problem that, and that is also my point that the, the way religion is studied and the terms that I use tend to be terms that come from a kind of secularized Protestant take on the world, which is also rooted in uh, idealism. So I call that a mentalistic approach that of course, already by virtue of that would very much single out religious traditions in which uh, there is a more open um, engagement uh, uh, with uh, objects, with practices, um, and so on, as in Catholicism, as in the Eastern Church, as in um, uh, Judaism, uh, uh, and so on, as in Islam, right. as in these African um, uh, traditions. So my uh, problem is also really to move beyond to a simple idea of what religion uh, might be. But like even someone like Weber, I very much respect um, Max Weber. I find his work incredibly uh, intriguing still, but he also had this slight anti-Catholic. We lost you for uh, yeah, we lost her. No yeah. matter and no spirit.
בשיא המתח. בסוף, ביהדות האוכל הוא הדבר הכי חשוב, אבל לא כאוכל לאלוהי ולא אוכל בני אדם. מה לא אוכל לאלוהי? מה? מה לא אוכל לאלוהי? לא אוכל את הדם של... אוכל. אוכל. אתה מכלה את ממונם של ישראל, מה זה? אוכלים ימין ושמאל באמצע. ברור, אלוהים אוכל כל היום. יש מזבח, אלוהים אוכל. מה עושים? היא איבדנו אותה לגמרי כרגע. לא, לא, לא. נראה לי שאני מחכה לזה, את יודעת, כדי לחזור להגיד שלום, אני, אין לי מושג מה... מה אומר הנוהל נימוס בזום? זה מכיר חוקק, בחוקק. מה חנה בבלי הייתה אומרת על זה? רגע, אבל יעל, יש לך, את יכולה לכתוב למייל? כן, כן, אני כבר, אני כבר בהליכים של הדבר הזה. או, הנה, 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 הנה. Yeah, almost. Almost back, sorry. Yeah, we were worried. I don't know what happened, it's so strange. אוקיי. אוקיי, אז אני רוצה להגיד תודה רבה לפרופסור מאיר, וגוד נייט לכולם כאן. תודה רבה שאתם מתכוונים אותנו. תודה רבה. תודה It was very uh, uh, enjoyable, yes. Thank, thanks a lot for the uh, uh, invitation. And I hope that we can stay in touch. Exactly. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes.